are the gifts of the Spirit for today? How are they to operate in our churches? And where has this new birth in questions of gifts of the Spirit come from? Hello, this is John Evans, and in today's brief review, I will be looking at Clara Day's Azusa Reimagined, uh, visiting back to the birth of American Pentecostalism in 1906 with the Azusa Street Revival. In 1906, Richard and Ruth Asbury from their home created a Bible study that would revolutionize the church in the United States and, to be honest, also in communities far abroad. It was a community largely of impoverished African Americans at a time of segregation, division, hatred, and violence. These Christians believed that one could have an active and personal relationship with the Holy Spirit that the Holy Spirit who delivered people from the demonic, that lifted people out of sicknesses and diseases, and that allowed for an inclusive relationship between all peoples, regardless of ethnicity, was still and is still active in the Church of God today. This Bible study would attract white and Latino congregants, and eventually after the the porch of the house in which they were holding the Bible study fell through. They rented a nearby stable, which, according to Clara Day, became the foundation of the Apostolic Faith Mission. The elders of the Apostolic Faith Mission consisted of both male and female parishioners, and women had an active participation in preaching and teaching. Although later Pentecostal movements, including Clara Day's own movement when she was growing up, eventually limited who could be ordained on the basis of their their background and their gender, the early apostolic faith mission had a much more earthy and practical approach. Whoever was able to preach and teach was sent out to preach and teach. This was largely inspired, as Clara Day notes, from the openness within a Methodism uh, to have women involved in ministry. So, I have to raise a very relevant question based off of these readings. And my question deals with pastoral practice. If the gifts of the Spirit are indeed for today, if the early Azusa Church was incredibly helpful in tearing down barriers of racial division and divisions between men and women in the early 1900s. How can we do the same in our churches today while respecting our liturgical and sacramental traditions? I fervently believe with all my spirit that these gifts of deliverance and of healing are indeed for today. Uh, From my Catholic background, I have walked in the very uh, monasteries and halls where great saints of God, who often were among the poorest and the most marginalized of the church, uh, performed miracles and actively were involved in parish life. Uh, I grew up in a parish called Sacred Heart. It was a Capuchin uh, friary in Yonkers, New York, where a Capuchin friar who was told he was too stupid to say Mass or hear confessions uh, would just open open the door for people to invite people in. And his name was Solanus Casey. And in hearing the concerns of the community, he would pray over individuals at the very doorstep where I would enter in to worship. And in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, obviously obviously, uh, well before my time, right, uh, he would supposedly perform miracles. And he is, uh, I think, one step away from being canonized formally by the Catholic Church. And we could see the same thing with Elder Paisios, uh, a monk of Mount Athos in Greece and Orthodoxy, who supposedly could bilocate, be in two places at the same time, uh, had the gift of prophecy, the gift of seeing into people's hearts, I'm aware of uh, several Protestant congregants coming from the non-denominational background who I've personally met, 
uh, who I strongly believe, um, not with out much discernment uh, to have certainly spiritual gifts and seem to have expressed these with meekness, kindness, and also with apostolic boldness as well. That being said, given all these examples that I've given, I could give male and female examples across denominational boards. How are we to implement them in our own uh, liturgical practice? in our own communities of faith. I think the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America is quite remarkable in the sense of being open and inclusive. It's one of the reasons why I have felt most at home in my own uh, teaching and preaching and my seminary work within the Evangelical Lutheran Church context. At the same time, as Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians, Uh, where the gifts of the Spirit can lead to some confusion within uh, worship, where one could prophesy over another, where speaking in tongues could be easily confused by outsiders um, who are not aware of the community's use or practice of tongues. Uh, It is something which can lead to deep confusion and deep disorganization. Uh, Also, in the life of Brother Martin Luther in the 16th century, while Luther was very open to gifts of the Spirit, In fact, Jan Hus, when he was burnt at the stake, uh, predicted, supposedly, that one would rise out of Germany to continue his reforms. And a century later, Luther thought that Hus was prophesying about him. So Luther was open to it. But there were also um, early movements of uh, so-called prophets in Wittenberg at the time that led to a lot of trouble and led to the Peasants' Revolt, and uh, which Luther vehemently resisted as being against scripture and against the gift of justification by faith. So we could see excesses can and do happen. So what are we to make of all this? I would argue that within our communities, we should openly state that in Bible studies and sessions of prayer and contemplation and of praise, that those who want to express the gift of tongues, that those who want to express um, the spiritual gifts that they believe they've perceived or received, that they are welcome to express those, uh, provided that it is, you know, discussed with the pastor in advance so that there is no confusion. I would argue that these communities should be able to be fully received within a sacramental system. Uh, 1 Corinthians has a very high view of the body and blood of Christ. Those who eat and drink of the sacrament unworthily get sick and die. Uh, That has been weaponized by movements, including those which I've come from. Uh, So I'm not here offering a commentary on that specific point. Paul has a very high view of the sacrament, but he has an equally high view of the Holy Spirit. So... I would argue that it is possible outside of partaking of the Lord's Supper on Sunday within our usual liturgical service, um, we could equally have Bible studies and we could equally have uh, environments where we could have a a shared potluck like the early agape love feasts of the early church where these gifts of the Spirit could be expressed. Um, I also strongly believe that the offering of the anointing of the sick spoken of in the epistle of James, uh, which is not considered a sacrament within the Lutheran church, but is still practiced by Lutheran congregations, can and should still be carried out. And that the uh, request for healing uh, and the implementation of that anointing, literally of oil on on those who are asking for healing, um, should be conducted somewhat regularly within the life of a parish. Um, I I would personally hope to do it at least two or three times a year if I was ever um, in an environment where there would be openness in a parish council or openness um, within the community itself, obviously consulting with all members of the parish communally. So this is all very important to me. I think it raises some fascinating questions. 
and leads us to really realize where we stand spiritually and liturgically, needing to preserve both strands of a high view of, you know, the offering of baptism and of the Lord's Supper, at the same time, equally understanding the gifts of the Spirit in an organized but not stifling manner. So very interesting stuff. I look forward to hearing from all of you soon.